All right, since you know everybody else has an awesome meme page, I figured I should have one of those too. Um, pretty much, uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about debugging, debugging Node.js tonight. Um, since I'm crazy, we're going to do a lot of live coding. So uh, that, I figured that would be much more helpful than me just slinging a bunch of pictures at you. So who am I? That's me. I'm Chris. Uh, Christopher W.J. Ruber, if you go looking for me online, because I use my full name most of the time. Um, I work for a company called Asset Record. Um, we do all sorts of stuff in the real estate area, but our current gig is basically we're uh, building a document engine for holding information about parcels and things like that. So uh, that's what we do right now. Uh, that's where I currently work as a day job. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything more to say about that. So that said, what is a debugger? Well, I'm just trying to level set here so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, pretty much everybody I think in this room has used a debugger, one shape, way, shape, or form. Um, that could fall under the line of using console.log. That actually counts as a debugger. It's a medium with which you use to actually try and figure out how your code works. It's a way to reason about code, whether that means that you're trying to reason about code that's running or that has run, doesn't make any difference. So we're just trying to detect errors in the system and correct them. It may not even be errors. You may just be trying to figure out how to implement something. So it can go all, all over the board. Um, the three primary ways of dealing with debugging in Node or pretty much any programming system across the board, uh, those big three. You know, you're going to use console.log, you're going to use maybe a logger. Uh, loggers can be nice because you can end up with a pretty printed JSON, something like that that's a lot easier to understand than a big splat of JSON that you have to like take and put into a formatter and so on and so forth much more painful than you probably want to deal with. Generally speaking, if you can help it, remote debugging or debugging in general is your best plan. Um, so that said, uh, I, I guess I just kind of want to get a feel for the group. How many people have used debuggers in here before? Awesome. Uh, remote debuggers? Beautiful. Okay, so then I'm not going to be going into two too much of crazy land for you. So I'm going to gloss over a little bit of this then. Um, I don't have to tell you why. In fact, you should want to use a debugger. So, uh, <laughs> callback hell is my favorite reason to use a debugger. I, you know, everyone has their own reasons why they use debuggers, but um, it's, it's not just that, of course, but, you know, if you've been in JavaScript very long, you're going to be dealing with 18 levels deep worth of trying to figure out what you're doing. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just getting a cold. Uh, so, because of the fact that JavaScript is functional, you're going to end up with deeply, deeply nested code. Um, yeah, all right. So, that being said, I'm not going to waste any more time on trying to explain what a debugger is, I'm going to show you. So, all right. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I had, it really is that tiny, okay. Let's fix that. I think people will be able to see that. This is much less interesting than his code, of course. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mentioned earlier that I had a, uh, a library that I built called a RESTful API uh, library. So you're going to see some of that here so that I can kind of guide you through this debugger process. Um, so basically, what I'm going to show you is kind of how, how the, my RESTful API library goes through code um, as you go along. Uh, I'm going to assume that most people have used console.log in some way, shape, or form before, so I'm going to skip over that. If someone would really like to learn more about console.log, come see me after this. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> that being said, we're going to use uh, the Node Inspector for remote debugging. So Node Inspector allows you to connect using uh, IntelliJ or WebStorm or any number of debugging platforms. Uh, and Node Inspector itself actually has a WebSocket a UI. So you don't even need to have a, a, an IDE to connect to it. So first and foremost, how do you get started? Well, what you're going to want to do is start with just installing it. That's very tiny. Uh, we're going to do this. All right, that's going to work way better. Pretty sure most people have done that before or something like that in uh, NPM. So I'm not going to get too deeply into that. This has already been installed, so hopefully this won't go awry. Hopefully NPM is up. That. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there we go. Uh, in order to get started with Node Inspector, just to start it up, let's see. Uh, I'm going to have to go further back through my history. All right, so I'll use a different port because I use 8080. It defaults support 8080, so I'm starting it up on 3080, just so everybody's aware. That's not the standard, but you can always change it with dash dash web port. So that dash dash web port will change it to anything you want. There is the ability to have a configuration file for Node Inspector that will read from all sorts of different places. So uh, it's in the documentation, so if you want to start it from all other places, that's a good place to start. So I've used nohup and, which backgrounds it and makes sure that you're not going to stop Node Inspector at any time. I usually want Node Inspector to just stay alive because any time I look at a debugger, uh, whether it's from one node instance that's running or another node instance that's running, Node Inspector can look at all of them. So if you have maybe, say, your web app that you're supporting, and then you have something that's command line that you need to take and look at and break into, you can look at either of them with the same node inspector instance. It can talk to all of them. <clears throat> all right, so this brings the node inspector up. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is get started, get the uh, application started that we're going to look at. Now, there's two ways for us to do, do we have Maybe, possibly, no, okay, so that way then. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get that to show up. Okay, so down here, where it says node dash dash debug 5860, it actually starts on 5858 by default. 5858 is, is the standard for it across the board, so if you were to just do dash dash debug and say on your index or whatever file that you want to run, it'll start up just fine. Uh, I'm specifying port yet again because across the board I have non-standard ports. So local yes. host 3080, correct? Uh, this is 5860. 5860. So what's happening here is we're going to start node in debug mode. This actually doesn't connect quite yet to the node inspector. So the node inspector stands alone over here, and then you stand up your application over here, and then you ask this thing over here to talk to this thing over here. So if that makes sense. And feel free to stop me at any point. I know I'm talking a little fast, but uh, if anybody has questions, don't hesitate. Yes? Yes, you can. Um, in fact, that's a uh, that's very, very good point. If you were to want to do that, it is just a matter of typing this and sending that signal to your node process. So USR 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If you send that to any process that is a node process, it will start the in-process debugger. So if you have something running that you need to deal with on production that is not clustered, <laughs> you can start a debugging instance with that, no problem. Good point. 
Um, another point to make here is that because the node debugger is also asynchronous, it doesn't automatically stop at any given point. So let's say, for instance, you're debugging a command line application that's changing things like you might, you might expect on a shell script. But you have something's going wrong, you have no idea what's going on. You can tell the node to break the moment that it starts by adding a dash brk after dash dash node. That means that it will stop on the very first line of code that you've written. It doesn't stop on any internal, uh, any internal libraries, but it will stop on your first line of code. And I will show that in just a moment uh, after I've kind of gone a little further into how the debugger works. So when you start it, it's going to have the debugger listening on the port that it's actually listening on. So if you're careful and you're running a very, very tiny little application, you might notice it somewhere hidden in all of the things that says when your uh, application starts. Now that said, if I were to look at that nohup.out file, you would also see that it's got the node inspector socket IO started line and it starts its own server in a specific location. Now again, because I use nohub, it automatically appended that to a different file instead of to standard out. And in order to get started debugging, you would go here. Now this is where I change things up a little bit. That port 5858 that I talked about, I used 5860 for this application, but if you have any number of applications running, it doesn't matter. Node inspector will look at all of them. So you only have to have that one node inspector. I'm sorry, what's that? What's special about 5860? Um, the fact that I have two other node debuggers running on 58, 58, 58, 59 also. Um, I have two other applications running on my box. So what's special about it is that I incremented it by two. That's um, all. So when you start with node inspector, you gave it a uh, port to run on? Yes. That's all you gave it to access it. How does that work in the node to latch up to uh, that specific debugger port that you started selling? Right. So node inspector doesn't know. That's actually uh, kind, of, uh, kind of what I was trying to get at here. Um, Node Inspector does not know what to look at to start with. When you connect to Node Inspector by going to it in your browser, the information that Node Inspector puts out right away tells you this is where you're going to go to talk to the Node Inspector. This is the port that you want Node Inspector to talk to to get to that debugger specifically rather than a different debugger that you might have used. Uh, this assumes that it's a default port. Right, exactly. I'm going to go to 5860 because I know I started my debugger on 5860. Yep. Good points. Uh, any other questions? You run one, one port per, per app.js or a JS file, is that correct? Um, it's one port per process. Per process. So whatever you start your server with, uh, when you say node, whatever, comes after that, you might be index.js or app.js or any number of things, uh, you'll say debug before that, dash dash debug, and that's where you say it specifically. All right. So, let me see. This is going to come up nicely for me. Hey, look at that. That worked a lot better than I thought it might. Did anybody read that? I think so. Okay. If anybody has trouble reading it, let me know. This kind of goes back to some of that uh, stylistic talk earlier. Um, I fully recognize this is not generally considered node stylistically correct code. So 
This is a standard debugger. At this point, it probably looks like a debugger that you've seen before. Um, any, any standard debugger kind of has a similar set of things that you'll notice on it. Um, it's got a list of or excuse me, files that you may have looked at and so forth. They're not necessarily open unless they're showing. They're just there for ease of use because you may be going back and forth through a bunch of different files while going up and down your call stack. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you have on the left side of your, your uh, left pane, you'll have a whole file list of your whole project. And this is going to be relative to the place that you started. So if you started in slash dev slash whatever your project file is, that's going to be where this is relative to. So at that point, you're going to see everything beneath it. You have to be actively running your app to be able to see any of this. Right. Yep. Which is uh, kind of interesting because this also will let you do some live coding while the app is running. So I've set, I've set mine up such that it's going to not automatically save back to the file system any changes that I make. But you can set up the node inspector to automatically save changes. So if you're messing with the file right in line here, it'll save it for you. So that, that can be kind of a nifty way to code if you like that. I find that a little bit um, scary, I <laughs> think is the right word. Uh, I don't. I, I like one file to be operating, or one one app to be operating on a file at a time, but that's just my style. Um, so that said, this looks a lot like Chrome, um, the the Chrome debugger, because it's based originally on the Chrome debugger, and <laughs> so on the upper right, you'll notice you've got watch expressions that look an awful lot like watch expressions that come directly out of Chrome. Uh, you have your breakpoints, scope variables, so on and so forth, that'll show up while you're actually debugging. Um, so, just to kind of give an example of how that works, I'm gonna set up a few breakpoints in my code here. Okay, so now all I did was set up three breakpoints by clicking on the left side of the code. So whenever you click on a number, that's going to set a breakpoint, which will in turn show up under the breakpoints on the right. So you can see I currently have four different breakpoints set up, and that means that if your code that's currently executing ever hits those breakpoints, it's going to stop that code from running any further, and it's going to show you what's going on there. It's going to introspect the variables, so you can easily see what's going on from the perspective of pure variables. You can also <clears throat> run your own code from there, but kind of the same way that you can in Chrome. So, if you to pull up the console, you can start messing with things. So if you want to see what's going on with, um, so what is this is nested thing? I can see I'm stopped on this, this secure function here, and I can look at is nested by either mousing over it, like you see right now, or I can come right down here, because I'm running code right in line at that same point that I'm stopped. And you can see it said the same thing from is nested there that it did from my mousing over it in the actual code window. Can you inject code in there too? Function define functions and stuff? Uh, in the, the minute, minute, minute window? In, in the console yeah. area? Yeah, absolutely. You can write functions. You could go completely nuts writing all sorts of crazy stuff. Absolutely. Uh, and I have. It's, it's actually quite useful for trying to introspect um, you know, different code structures, data structures, trying to figure out what's wrong maybe with your code uh, or maybe what's right with your code. I've had that happen too. Same in Chrome. So basically, you can access anything at points where it's breakpointed as you could at that scope. Um, 
Yes. Exactly. So you're inside that closure. You're literally, the code is stopped and you're running code from that closure. Um, you can also see what, what is inside of that closure, which is kind of a nifty thing in and of itself, um, right here. So from the closure that we're sitting at, you can clearly see that locally, I only have a few variables that I can work with. But I can also see that I'm sitting inside of another closure that has this comments and posts set inside of it. So I can also access comments and posts. And I can find that out very easily here if I might not have known that otherwise. So yeah, that's a very good point. <coughs> Um, so one of the things that I've been, I, I'm already doing here without making too much note of it because it's more about the library that I built than debugging, but uh, I'm jumping around with callbacks by setting more than one at once rather than trying to figure out if I'm going to go with a uh, step to the next thing because in JavaScript land, Stepping to the next thing might not exactly work exactly as you expect it to because everything just keeps running. It's asynchronous. It, so it kind of is a little easier um, to me to just set callbacks where I actually want to see what's happening. Now, you know, that's, that being said, it's not necessary. Uh, I can just step to the next thing, just like you could in any other debugger. And once you get to the end of a function, it'll come back up a level and show you exactly where it's going throughout the code. Uh, once I've let it go with a resume function up here, it'll stop at my next debugging statement, or my next break line, and it'll come in there and say, okay, I've got more stuff for you to do. Uh, which can become a pain. Sometimes it becomes uh, kind of painful if you have say, you know, 18 breakpoints because you, you're digging really deep trying to find what's wrong with your code in a number of different places. You can stop them all, all at once with one click and that will stop every last one of your breakpoints and you can just let, let it go from that point. So those are pretty much the basics of running your node inspector for a server application. Uh, does anybody have questions based on that to start with? Okay. Um, yeah. So I've been using the pull stack quite a bit um, at my job, and it's really useful to be able to step back um, and look through code, but it ends up being really problematic pretty quickly when you using some other third-party libraries like Promises or Async. Mm -hmm. Because of the callbacks, uh, the call stack ends up just stopping at a certain point and says, oh, it's in Async somewhere, can't help you anymore. So I'm curious if you've run into that and how you get around that. <coughs> I have. Um, so I haven't used Q uh, quite as much as you know some people may have, uh, but I've used Async quite significantly. Um, I've found that it, it does definitely have some issues with large recursion levels. Uh, those are usually the spots that you tend to run into it. Now that said, um, there are ways around it. Um, it's not usually very useful um, to try and figure out how, you know, what your watch expression might be or what you're going to try to break on. You can. There, there is a way to specifically tell the debugger, stop. So you can put code in, in your code to tell it, break at this point. Um, I honestly don't know off the top of my head what that is, but I do know that it's possible. Uh, but yeah, it, it does definitely, with, with very large levels of recursion on functions, it's painful. No, no question. Sorry. Is the question that your call stack No, it doesn't go back far enough. So I'll run into a case where it's like five levels or so, even though you might have, you know, ten levels of async callbacks. Um, 
you just it stops and you can't debug back any farther. So the only thing you can do is reset another breakpoint a lot farther up and rerun the app. And so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, a lot of the times what happens in Node is instead of um, the call stack not going back far enough, the call stack goes back to where something came back onto the event loop and it has no context prior to that. So a um, some sort of asynchronous process comes back, let's say uh, Mongo uh, returns with some data and there's a bug in Mongoose or something that you're using. Um, the call stack's only gonna go back maybe like three functions or maybe five uh, because a bug or something occurred, but it can't go beyond that because that's where the call stack even just begins. Right? There's nothing prior to that because that bit of data just came back onto the event loop. So it's kind of like a new function to just run at that point. So it can't be, and that's that's absolutely the case. It could also be running on the next tick. Yeah. And that in and of itself is something I've found happens very regularly. It's not that it's even not going back far enough. It's just that you're it being the nature of being asynchronous it's not going to have the information from before because it's doing something new now because it's on the next tick. So, same thing happens in that case also. Yep. Yes? Um, when you're, one question about security, uh, when you've got this running on you know, some port that you've determined uh, and listening and waiting for, for a connection from your client, is there any way to lock that down to, let, to stop people like me from also connecting to your server and change your code and see your code um, and, and, and perform functions? Good question. Um, so the answer is yes, there is a way to make that to happen. It's not part of Node Inspector. You would have to run that up as part of your own firewall system. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I want to get into firewalling and things like that, but the, the long and the short of it is it's definitely possible, but it's not secure by default in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, if you want to mess with me, you can certainly try and jump onto my box. That's that's cool. I'm good at it. Just a simple question. I see there's a console up there. Yes. Do you have to like pipe standard out to that console, or you don't? Um, it, so, in fact, this console that's that's currently shown um, isn't useful at this point okay. because there's I'm not on a breakpoint. When I'm stuck on a breakpoint, then I can type things into the console and it'll run that on the server. So it basically sends that particular standard in down to the server, runs okay. it, and pipes the output back to here. Gotcha. Can you also set conditional breakpoints? Um, conditional breakpoints. I know you can, but I don't know how off the top of my head. Does someone else? Right click on the or right click on the line number. Okay. It looks like the same GUI, so I'm thinking it would be, right? Yeah. Well, you can do add conditional. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. There, there you go. Thanks. Fair enough. Yes? A little bit of an opposite from the call stack. Do you know if uh, this particular uh, interface allows you to blacklist like, <coughs> framework uh, files for, for step-ins? I know that Chrome has a recent link that lets you do that. So I'm sure that's what I did. Um, the answer is I'm not positive. I've never had to do that myself, um, so I don't know for sure. Sorry. Um, the I was actually going to highlight that as a, a point that I find to be very useful, in so much that um, you can follow your code all the way through your through the framework files. So if you're wondering what the heck is going on in Express. If you've got something wrong in Express land, that, <laughs> that might potentially be a, a way for you to look into it. That sounds kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> anyways, um, so the answer is I'm not positive. So uh, I can certainly look it up for you if you want after this. Uh, anyways, so I'm going to go ahead, get rid of this console. Uh, one thing that uh, I mentioned a little earlier that I'll just show real quickly uh, is breaking when you start your script. So if you wanted to break when you start your script, rather than 
trying to jump into a, that script um, somewhere that you've set a breakpoint because you're, again, maybe you're running a, just a standard script rather than a, a server framework. You can use this dash break. It shows that debugger is immediately listening on 5860 and nothing else has happened. I haven't started my, my server, nothing. It's just hanging out, waiting for me to connect to it. So now that I've connected to, this ser to the server that it is waiting on, I can see, because my resume button is depressed, that it's ready for me to keep going with it, so I can step to the next function and start going through line by line and seeing what's going on. So if I wanted to actually just debug a script, that's how I would do it. So start from the beginning and move on through. Now you, at this point, of course, you can set breakpoints. So you don't have to go step over, step over, step over, step over, step over, and so forth. You can go directly from one thing to the next. Like that. I'm glad that worked. <laughs> so that's pretty much that's pretty much the long and the short of it. Um, it's pretty much your tour for the night. Uh, any other questions that I can answer? Very cool. Uh, what's going to happen if you click the pause button right now? Right now? Yeah. Not a heck of a lot because at this point it's not connected to anything. It just doesn't show that it's not. Oh, okay. I'm asking because because some IDs will allow you when you click the pause button they'll break and show you where the where the program is right now, it's very useful when you have an infinite recursion. Right. And you know you can hear the CPU spinning, but you don't know where. So you can just hit pause and it's going to break where it is. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I know this, this is a little bit smarter than that. Actually, um, I've actually found that this is a, a pretty smart uh, pretty smart UI. Uh, it's, this thing was made by the people at Strongloop. Um, if you're familiar, they're pretty behind Node. Um, one of the dudes that he mentioned earlier came out of Strongly. Um, I don't remember which one. So uh, one of the one of the main guys that's responsible for Node. So um, they they're pretty good. Is the long and the short of that. I saw another hand. Uh, so is this debugger right now currently connected to that same Node process that you started before? Not the one I started before. I actually started another one up so that if you had a question that I needed to use the debugger for it, that it would be. Um, so now it, now it is. Did you have to restart Node Inspector? I didn't have to restart Node Inspector. Um, I just restarted my Node instance for the Express server that I'm running. Node Inspector doesn't have to be restarted each time that you want to change something. Node Inspector is just started the once, and then you can connect to any port with it from that point forward. It's pretty nifty. You look like you got another one for me. Cool. <laughs> All right. Anything else that anybody has? All right. Well, there you go. for the win.
this is on a conscious level. That's I guess it's kind of a single interface, but it's not something that I can. Right. You're more like, like on the server. What's that? It's like individual tabs on the front. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It seems like single process too, right? It's sort of single process. That was the question that he kind of had is, is, is it single process? And it seems like it. I just open up another tab and it just didn't, unless I close it. It's, it's single process for that tab that goes through Node Inspector. Um, I've used it for up to three different um, server processes at once in different browser tabs. But What's that? On different ports, yes. Not the same port. I, yeah, so I, I imagine that would be interesting. Yeah, it would be three different processes, but not three different node inspector processes. Just one node inspector process with all three different ports. So it's kind of interesting. Showcases some of the asynchrony of node, in theory, if it works. Cool. So, there you go. Very good. Very useful. If against the Chris, I know I learned a, a t absolute ton tonight. Um, I've always had trouble with, maybe to Scott's point, I've always had trouble with the, uh, the inspector as well. Mm. So maybe yeah, it's, maybe it's better now that Strong Loop has kind of taken it over. Yeah. Um, but I know it was kind of it kind of sat idle for a couple of years. It did since it was initially written. So they picked it back up about a year ago, and like really did a good job of getting it rerunning and moving. And they actually moved it from just Chrome to the Blink-enabled browser state, which is still just Chrome, but right. Firefox eventually plans to do that too. So cool. at some point, it should run on Firefox. Awesome. Awesome. All right, well, uh, be sure to check out uh, the Front End Masters workshop that's coming up on Friday. I think it's 99 bucks right now. Um, give that a look. Uh, big thanks to Mark Romanski for offering up that seat. And uh, th everybody, thanks for coming.